So multiple sclerosis, and we normally shorten that to MS, is uh, an autoimmune condition. So it's caused by dysfunction of your own immune system uh, that normally should just be there and uh, only active when you're fighting off infections and you know, bacteria and viruses, for example. Um, but in autoimmune conditions, the immune system becomes dysfunctional and it attacks your own uh, uh, body tissues. And in this case, we're talking about the central nervous system. So that's the brain, the spinal cord and the optic nerves. So in MS, there is uh, uh, immune attack against uh, parts of your uh, uh, your central nervous system, which leads to the, uh, these episodes or attacks um, uh, or relapses uh, of MS. And there's additionally, uh, and in some patients more than others, there's a uh, uh, Sort of wear and tear or degenerative effect on, on, on the nerves so that can uh, manifest with more progressive gradually uh, worsening uh, uh, signs of MS as well. So um, there's no single cause of MS and there are still some things we don't understand about that but we have a fairly good understanding of, of the, uh, the collection of different risk factors that, that, um, uh, that lead to MS. So uh, it's not really what we'd consider a familial condition, but there is a genetic link. So there is a, a genetic component to the risk. Um, and for example, if you look at twin studies, so if you look at identical twins who have got exactly the same um, uh, gene type, uh, there's only about a 25%, so one in four uh, concordance rates, so risk of, uh, of of the other twin having it. So although that's 25%, that means that 75% of the, the risk is other things that are that are not your genes. So those things we think um, are uh, so uh, a combination of how your immune system is set up genetically, uh, but then other factors. So uh, they include your uh, vitamin D status. So we know that low vitamin D and, and low exposure to UV uh, light, for example, uh, we know that's important for bone health, but actually there's a very important role for vitamin D in the immune system. So we know that low vitamin D, low UV exposure, particularly during childhood uh, and early adulthood, uh, is one risk factor of this uh, dysfunction of the the, uh, the immune system. And the other factor which we think is important is exposure to certain infections and viruses, but again, particularly in childhood, probably. And um, that's not to say that MS is an infection because it is not, but uh, exposure to certain viruses. And there's a lot of interest in Epstein-Barr virus, which is the virus that causes glandular fever, for example, um, as one of the most important ones. Uh, being exposed to that virus and infection, even after you recover, uh, sets up long term effects of the immune system that later in life uh, can uh, uh, lead to these uh, symptoms, particularly uh, if you've got those other factors. So the right gene type, low vitamin D status and, and probably other factors as well that we don't fully understand. So the initial uh, symptoms can be quite nonspecific. So they can be symptoms that uh, a lot of us might experience uh, in our normal day to day life and it can be nothing serious. So, you know, pins and needles or numbness, that's just very brief. You know, we, we, we might all experience things like that. But uh, uh, in MS, those uh, symptoms would normally be uh, longer lasting. So going on for days or weeks uh, before settling down. And there are certain characteristic uh, symptoms and episodes that are that are more common uh, in MS uh, and and three mainly so uh, the first would be uh, an optic neuritis the second would be a, a brain stem syndrome and the third would be a partial myelitis so by that um, uh, I mean uh, so with an optic neuritis that's inflammation of the optic nerve so you might get uh, blurring or loss of vision in the in the center of your uh, center of your your vision in one eye uh, it'd be very rare to be in both eyes and Again, not just transient blurring of vision that we, we might all get that lasts a few few minutes or seconds, but loss of vision that's there for a few days or even a, a few weeks at a time. So that's uh, what we call optic neuritis. Uh, the brainstem is uh, the uh, structure at the base of the brain that uh, controls a lot of important functions, but um, getting an episode of inflammation there might, for example, cause um, an episode of double vision, uh, with vertigo or imbalance uh, or slurring of speech or numbness on the face. Uh, those would be fairly common symptoms. And a myelitis means inflammation of the spinal cord. So a myelitis might present with numbness or uh, weakness in one or uh, both sides of the body, the arms or legs, sometimes affecting bladder or bowel function. Uh, and all of these would follow that same sort of time course. So coming on 
over a period of days uh, or a week, lasting maybe a week or two, and then and then gradually settle them down. That's the sort of time scale that we normally see with those episodes. That's always a difficult question because you know some of these symptoms are uh, uh, quite non-specific. They can be due to all sorts of other conditions, uh, many of which are, are, not, are not serious, and some of which uh, can even be normal. So you know we've all experienced pins and needles or numbness in an arm or leg when we've leant on it or slept on it and it and it, and it passes off quite quickly um but uh i i tell my patients um for example even those who've already got them actually you know, when do i when do i go back to see my doctor or or, or or see you uh it's with symptoms that uh seem new or different uh they're lasting at least a day or two um uh, before settling um uh, and seem out of the ordinary. Uh, so uh, I think if you follow that uh, that rule, uh, you, you know you're you're going to pick up most things that are important, uh, um, but yeah, without uh, seeing your doctor, you know, too often. So for a clinician, so for usually be a neurologist or a neurologist specialising in MS, uh, it is predominantly a clinical diagnosis. So there's a very typical set of symptoms, uh, some of which we've discussed uh, already, and uh, clinical signs, so things that we, we would pick up on the neurological examination. Um, but these days you would almost always uh, uh, do some confirmatory tests. So that would typically be uh, an MRI scan. So that'd be an MRI of the brain and possibly spinal cord as well. And that in particular is a pretty sensitive test for MS. So it would almost always be abnormal uh, in patients who have MS. There are you know, occasional exceptions to that. The other tests that we do uh, can include a lumbar puncture, so that's a spinal fluid examination. So that involves uh, under local anaesthetic, uh, putting a needle into the lower back and taking uh, a few mils of the spinal fluid off and sending that to the lab for analysis. Um, less often that we need to do that these days if the clinical history in the MRI is typical you know there's no need to do a lumbar puncture but it can be useful in uh, complex or uncertain cases uh, there's a number of blood tests that we'll normally do uh, or may well have been done before you even see a neurologist uh, those are not really to test for MS there is no blood test for MS but they're useful to rule out some other conditions that can uh, mimic or, or look uh, somewhat like MS um, and finally, there are what are called ev uh, evoked potentials. So these are electrical tests on the uh, optic nerve function and sometimes other areas of the nervous system, uh, which, again, we do less often these days uh, if those other tests we talked about uh, uh, are positive. Once the diagnosis is main, made, the first steps are obviously to communicate that in a clear and sensitive way and emphasizing that for many patients MS can be a very manageable and mild condition even without treatment uh, actually I have you know, lots of patients who uh, are just going about their day-to-day -day lives and you, you know you wouldn't know anything was wrong with them if you looked at them in the street but uh, uh, patients who uh, are having significant or frequent relapses uh, we would be starting to talk about uh, about treatments um, uh, which we'll go into more detail about but um, the the first steps are i think adjusting to the diagnosis understanding what what the condition is what to expect uh what steps the patient can take to uh improve their outlook so uh, lifestyle modification is important and uh, what we call general brain health so you know the most important thing there is not smoking uh, we know that increases a uh, risk of progression and, and worsening nms following a healthy diet um uh taking vitamin d supplements so the, these uh, you know uh, 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 regular exercise so these are all important in just general brain health uh, before we start to talk about more more specific treatments 